This video will be over section 2.2 talking about infinite limits and limits at infinity. The main topics in this section will talk about infinite limits first. Um, actually be able to draw some parallels between some problems in section 2.1 um, dealing with vertical asymptotes and holes. Uh, the second section will be limits at infinity um, and really what we'll be using that for later on in the class is the horizontal asymptotes aspect. And then the last little section, we'll just have a problem to put it all together, finding horizontal and vertical asymptotes of a rational function. Right, so the first section is dealing with infinite limits. Um, what do we mean? What is an infinite limit? Well, an infinite limit is when you have a limit that's infinity or negative infinity. So the definition here, let y be equal fx, be the graph of a function. Then a one-sided limit from the left is infinite if, so you see the one-sided limit from the left, our left being the exponent looking minus sign there if we get infinity or negative infinity for the limit. And we can do the same thing for the right, which is why I didn't rewrite it. Um, but if you replace from the left with from the right, meaning you just have a plus here, same idea. All right, so we just say a limit is infinite if when we evaluate the limit, we get infinity or negative infinity. And then similar to limits that aren't infinite, if the two one-sided limits are the same, let's say f has an infinite limit as x approaches c, if the limit, notice it's not one-sided here, limit as x approaches c of f of x equals infinity or negative infinity, the above limits only exist if the one-sided limits are both the same. All right, so if they're both infinity, if they're both negative infinity, we're good. If they're opposites, then they will not exist or anything else. All right, so we'll look at a graph like we did in the last section just to understand this a little bit better. And it says, for the graph below, evaluate the following limits. So we are focused on negative 2 and 3, doing our limits at negative 2 and 3. So I'm going to go ahead and point out negative 2 first. You'll notice both of these have the vertical lines called vertical asymptotes already drawn in for us at x equals negative 2. So I'm not actually going to copy over that. This one is at x equals negative 2 on the left, and the one on the right is at x equals 3. So where we're dealing with the limits here are at the vertical asymptotes. Right. So the first part, we want to find the limit as x goes to negative 2 from the left. So we're going towards this vertical asymptote from the left. We're on this little section over here. on the left and it's you can see it's going up 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 it almost looks vertical right, and I would keep going up because the way vertical asymptotes works is it keeps going up to infinity the y value is going to go up to infinity as we go closer and closer towards negative 2 from the left so the answer here is infinity and so as we walk towards negative 2 from the left, we're walking on this little section. We're just going up, 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 up to infinity. Right. And that's what vertical asymptotes do. If, if your graph is near a vertical asymptote and it just you kind of is very close to it, riding almost parallel to it, that's how it's going to work. So if we're going towards negative 2 from the right, so we're still looking at this vertical asymptote and we're coming from the right, we want to be on this little section here. And going towards it from the right, we're walking down, 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 down. And it's just going to keep going down to negative infinity. All 
it's not gonna have the stopping point you can't see if it even has a stopping point but it will not have a stopping point if we're along a vertical asymptote okay now the third part is the limit as x goes to negative 2 you'll notice that these are different they're both infinities but one's positive one's negative so they are different which means it d and e right if the one side limits are different it's d and e it doesn't matter infinity is not more special than a different you know regular number all right so the last three parts are about three where part d here we want to go look at the limit as x goes to three from the left so we're looking at this vertical asymptote and we're going towards this vertical asymptote from the left and you see we're going straight to this point even though it's on a vertical asymptote we're going towards this point here and the y value is zero right just because there's a vertical asymptote doesn't mean it has to be infinity or negative infinity it's just that if it's riding alongside it then we have to assume it's going all the way up or down Now, if we go towards 3 from the right, then we're going towards this vertical asymptote from the right. You can see this one looks very similar to the other two in that it's riding along the vertical asymptote. It's going up to infinity. And then the conclusion here, these are both different again. It doesn't matter that one's zero and one's infinity, just that they're two different things. It's also D and E. Right. Now, if they were both the same number, we just didn't have that example in this problem. But if these were both infinity, then this would be infinity. Same rules as before. All right, so very frequently vertical ascent, or sorry, um, lim limits that are infinite are vertical asymptotes. The way we want to be able to tell whether we have a vertical asymptote from a formula or not is what happens when we plug it in. All right, so this theorem says let f of x be a rational function. All right, that means it's a polynomial. over a polynomial. In fact, you can usually can go even farther even though um, rational function technically means this. As long as it's not piecewise and it's a fraction, you're probably looking at something that's going to work here. But a rational function is a polynomial over a polynomial, which is all we'll be dealing with in this section. It says, if the limit as x goes to c from the left is a number over 0, and that number is not 0, so similar to what we dealt with before, then the one-sided limit is infinite. And the same is true for the right one-sided limit. So if we got number over 0 means the one-sided limit are infinity or negative infinity. They could be different, they can be the same, but they have to be that, one of those two. Right. And the real reason is here is because that means they have a vertical asymptote. So in our example above, just you know, to kind of understand, with rational functions, you can't have it going towards zero. All the vertical asymptotes act like this. They get really steep close to them with rational functions. So this is just some made-up function to explain other possibilities. All right. Now, the important thing here that I have written is how do you tell if it's infinity or negative infinity? for the one-sided limits. And I'll show you how to figure that out as we work through the problems. Right. 
the first one we have let f of x equals 7x over x minus 5 evaluate the following limits and use infinity or negative infinity when appropriate All right so you can see from this problem we are focused on the limit as x goes to 5 the best thing since it's not piecewise is to just start by plugging in 5. Right, we still are going to hold the rules we learned in 2.1. So even though we're looking at the one side limits first, we want to start by plugging in x equals 5. So I'll do that over here. So we got 7 times 5 over 5 minus 5. 7 times 5 is 35 over 5 minus 5 is 0. And this is exactly telling us we have number over 0. So we must have infinity or negative infinity for the one-sided limits. It, so for part A, it's going to be infinity or negative infinity. For part B, it's going to be negative infinity or infinity. Part C will depend on what we get for parts A and B. All right. Now on the homework, you have multiple guesses. So, you know, you could just guess twice and eventually get it right. But you don't want to do that because on a test, you only have one chance. So how do we know which one it is? Well, the first part is we're coming from the left. So the x values are smaller. You know, what I like to do as a general rule is just plug in a number that's close to 5, that's smaller here, because we're coming from the left, like 4.9, and see whether it's positive or negative. All right, so the reason I chose 4.9 is because it's smaller than 5 and close. All right, now you might be asking the question, 4.9, can we plug in 4? Maybe. 4 is kind of far away. It has to be you know, relatively close. You can plug in 4.99 if you want, or 4.999, but 4.9 is definitely going to work for these problems. Now, if you're just 0.1 away, it'll be close enough. So what we want to do is plug in 4.9 into our problem here. So we got 7 times 4.9 over 4.9 minus 5. Now, all we care about is whether it's positive or negative. Um, if you want the exact number, you can do that in your calculator. So we got 7 times 4.9 on top and 4.9 minus 5 on the bottom and then if we divide them we got 34.3 divided by negative 0.1 is negative 343 right now the main thing here since we got a negative out and we are close that means this is going to go to negative infinity Okay, so it has to be infinity or negative infinity. We plug in a number that's close and to the left and see that it is, in fact, negative infinity. Right, now we can do the same thing from the right, the same idea. From the right means the x values are positive. Or bigger, not positive, but bigger. So we want to plug in something that's close to 5 but bigger and 5.1, you know, being 0.1 away is going to be good enough. And we do the same thing, you see whether it's positive or negative. So we got 7 times 5.1 over 5.1 minus 5 
go ahead and do that in our calculator again. I mean, this one you can do it all at once, so I'm just going to do it all at once. But if you have a different calculator, you might have to break it down into parts like I did. 7 times 5.1 divided by 5.1 minus 5. And we get 357. Right. And same reason as before, since this is positive, it goes to positive infinity. You don't have to write the plus sign in there, and the homework will probably mark you wrong, so don't actually write that in there. Leave it like this, just infinity. All right, but just to recap, since I didn't write it in, we chose 5.1 because it's close and bigger than 5. All right, so once you've done that, we got the two one-sided limits. Then we see they are different. Since they are different, the limit as x goes to 5 is d and e. And you can also graph this to see that it works out, but like with before, you know, usually we start with kind of quote unquote simple example that the graph isn't too hard to look at, but then the other examples they might not be as easy to look at. Um, but let's go ahead and graph 7x divided by x minus 5. I'm going to hit zoom 6 to make sure I'm in the standard window. And you'll notice that, you know, actually, we kind of see it diving off here. If we look at where 5 is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we could believe that this is going down to the infinity, but we don't even see this side because it's probably up here. So let's go ahead and zoom out. And if you zoom out, that's a little bit better. You know, it's kind of hard to see where 5 is, but 1, 2, 3, or five right around here so you know kind of see where it breaks up as we go towards it from the left we go towards negative infinity as we go towards it from the right we go towards positive infinity All right so one thing about graphing is you know if you're at that standard window you might not see your whole picture and that's always the danger with graphing to try to get answers you might not see what's going on you know, in last section we saw that you might not see a hole. It's just very important to make sure you can do this by hand, and then if you want to use your gra graphing calculator to check, that's when you use it. All right, so we got another similar example here. This one we have f of x equals negative in front, and then we got 10x minus 10 on the top over in parentheses x minus 10 to the fourth on the bottom evaluate the following limits and use infinity or negative infinity when appropriate All right so you can see what we're interested in this problem is 10 we want to plug in x equals 10 and i'll just do it like last time you always want to start by plugging in if it's not piecewise it doesn't matter if you might end up doing infinity or negative infinity Okay, so we got negative in front, then we got 10 times 10 minus 10, a whole bunch of 10s, over 10 minus 10 to the fourth. Okay, so on the top, 10 times 10 is 100, minus 10 is 90. On the bottom, 10 minus 10 is 0, to the fourth is 0. And same thing as last time, probably not a surprise for what we're working on right now, but this is a non-zero number over zero, which means the one-sided limits are infinite. Since the one-sided limits are infinite, we have to check 
by doing exactly what we did last time. All right, so for the first one, we want to go towards 10 from the left. Plug in, let's say 9.9. .9. We want something a little smaller than 10, but close. So let's go ahead and do that. Make sure you plug in something close. If you just plug in any number smaller than 10, it might not work. So we got negative 10 times 9.9 .9 minus 10 over 9.9 .9 minus 10 to the fourth. Go ahead and put that in your calculator. So don't forget that negative in front. I might have it covered up. There we go. We got negative 10. Oops. Negatives out front. 10 times 9.9 .9 minus 10 divided by, and then the bottom, 9.9 .9 minus 10 raised to the fourth. Make sure you, if you want to use that negative, or when you use that negative, it's out front. So it can't be just on the 10 has to be out front of the whole thing. And we got some really big negative number. Negative 890,000. Well, once again, the only important thing is that since this is negative, that means the limit's going to negative infinity. Right, now we want to do the same thing for part B. We're going, we're asked to write one sided limit, so we want to plug in something a little bit bigger than 10, let's say 10.1. So we got our negative in front, we got 10 times 10.1 minus 10 over 10.1 minus 10 to the fourth power. And let's type that in. We got negative in front. We got our 10 times 10.1 minus 10 divided by 10.1 minus 10 raised to the fourth power. We get negative 910,000. Once again, what matters is that this is negative. The number itself doesn't matter. It's uh, just the sign. It's negative. And this time we do have the same one-sided limit. Since the one-sided limits are the same, the limit is that number, which is negative infinity. So one-sided limits are, or, sorry, infinite limits are work exactly the same as not infinite limits. It's just that at the beginning, you know, you'll plug in if it's not piecewise. If you just got a number here, so let's say we got like five when we plugged it in, then all these answers would be five and there'd be nothing more to do. Since we had a number over zero, we had to do the one-sided limit, plug in something close. That's where infinite limits are different. Now the next thing is limits at infinity. This works a lot different than the other ones because of what it's asking. Um, so we're, when referring to limits at infinity, we are specifically asking to evaluate either the limit as x goes to infinity of fx or the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x. All right, so these are much different than infinite limits because, or any limits that we've done, because you can't actually plug in infinities. So we'll see how to work around that. So it's not like plugging in four. You plug in and you get it, because infinity is just an idea. It's a very, very big, large number. Uh, one thing that's nice is you can only approach them one way already. Um, if you think about the number line, we have negative infinity over here and infinity over here. We can only go towards infinity 
from the left, they can only go towards negative infinity from the right. So they're automatically one-sided limits. Right, we don't have to check one-sided limits for limits at infinity because it's already doing it for us. Already one-sided. And then the second one is point is what I already said. You can't actually plug in numbers as in infinity or negative infinity because they're not real numbers. We'll see how to deal with that. Um, but first, we'll look at the graph just to understand what it's asking. It says use the following graph of y equals f of x to evaluate the limits below. So we have the graph of x of x and we want the limit as x goes to infinity and x goes to negative infinity. So the idea here is infinity as x goes to negative infinity is all the way to the right. So you just want to ask yourself what's happening if we move, keep moving to the right. And you won't be able to see the whole graph naturally. This one stops at 10. So you have to just use your judgment. Where does it look like it's going towards? All right, so for part A, you know, think about going to the right. If we're going to infinity, we don't care about what's over here. We only want to go to the right. So, you know, take the section it's on. And what Y value is it going towards? Well, you know, like I said, we have to use our best judgment. Your best judgment will be correct as long as you're doing the right thing. You know, this looks like it's going towards y equals negative 2. That's where it's flattening out. And that's going to be our answer. So the limit as x goes to infinity of f x is flattening out at negative 2. Yeah, you just have to assume the pattern of what's going on continues. Right. If we're going towards negative infinity, x going towards negative infinity, that's to the left. Go all the way left. And once again, this one only goes to negative 10, so we have to use our judgment of what's happening. If we're going to the left, we only care to be on this last little section. And this one just goes up and up and up, and it's not looking like it's flattening out at all. It's just going up and up. So what we have to do is just assume that it's going to keep going up as we go to the left. All right, it's not flattening out, it just keeps going up. That idea, if it's going up forever, it's going up to infinity. So we can have an, we can have infinity for the answers here as well, but that's it. All right, we look at the graph as it goes to the right. That's the infinite infinity one. We go to the left, and that's the negative infinity one. Just assume that pattern continues. Um, for this section. The only limits on infinity we will be dealing with are polynomials and rational functions. And a polynomial and a rational function, you should be very familiar with them. Um, I'll remind you of the formal thing because we're going to use it in this section. Um, a function f of x is a polynomial if it's written of this form f of x equals a subscript n times x to the n power plus and then a whole bunch of other things like that. Essentially, a polynomial is a sum of numbers times x raised to positive whole numbers. Right, so the powers on x must be positive whole numbers. That's the main thing. All right, the leading term, this is very important when we deal with limits at infinity. It's really the most and only important thing about the polynomial. The leading term 
is the term of the polynomial with the highest power of x. And this term will dictate the value of the infinite limit. All right, so wherever you see the highest power of x in a polynomial, that's what you're going to use to figure out the limit. But we won't have many examples here because once you work a couple that are all the same, the idea is going to be the same. It says for the following polynomials, determine the leading term and evaluate the limit as x approaches infinity and negative infinity. Number one here we have polynomial g of x equals 16x minus 3 plus 4x cubed minus 5x to the 6. Our leading term doesn't have to be in front, it's just the number with the largest power of x. And if you have a negative, like a minus here, do not forget that. So our leading term is negative 5x to the 6. Right. The reason why this is so important is you can't really plug in infinity and negative infinity to a polynomial you get a lot of what are called indeterminate forms and it's completely avoidable just by looking at the leading term. So we're going to use only this to figure out the infinite limit. Alright, so we'll do two problems because we have to do two things. We have to do the limit at infinity and the limit at negative infinity. So we'll do the limit as x goes to infinity of negative 5x to the 6th first. So the idea is now you can't really plug in infinity, but you can think about infinity being a very large number. So what I do is kind of plug it in, but I put quotes around it. Meaning I have negative five and in place of X we have infinity. Infinity is just a very large number. Now what you want to do is simplify because it's going to be infinity or negative infinity for the answer. So we got negative 5 out front. And the nice thing is if you think about a really large number, raising it to a power, it stays really large. So infinity to any positive power is still infinity. If, if that's not making quite sense, just think about using a really large number. You know, that's a billion or something. I don't know how many times I have zero. If you raise it to the sixth power, you know, one E48 means one with 48 zeros after it. That's a very big number. All right, so any large number becomes larger. And now we have to be careful with the negative here. If we multiply a really large number by a negative number, we should get really large but negative. Right. So imagine I take what we got here and I multiply it by negative 5. Well, that's a negative 5 in front of 48 zero. So that's really large, but negative, And that's what we would describe as negative infinity. Uh, but that is our answer. Once you have just infinity with a plus or minus, that is your answer. And this one is negative. 
So the limit as x goes to infinity is negative infinity. And now we want to do the other infinite limit, the limit as x goes to negative infinity. Once again, just use the leading term. It'll tell you the answer. So we got negative 5 times. And this time we're using negative infinity, so do not forget that negative sign. But this is a really large negative number to the 6th power. You know, if you want, you can always just use an example in your calculator or think about what happens if you raise to an even or odd power. Since this is even, it should become positive. But if you want to check, think about it. Let's do negative 1 with a whole bunch of zeros raised to the 6th power. It becomes positive because it's even powered. So this part becomes positive infinity. We still got our negative sign out front. And then this is the same thing we had last time. If we multiply a really large positive number by negative 5, then it becomes a really large negative number. And so our answer for this part is also negative infinity. And so that the way that worked from the last is the same as the last time. It's a really large number times a negative number becomes a really large negative number. Okay, so one thing we I'll add at the beginning here is that the infinite limits at infinity of polynomials. are always infinity or negative infinity. You just have to go through the steps to figure out which one it is. Okay. But if you try to plug in infinity to the beginning here, or negative infinity, you're going to run into trouble because infinity minus infinity is indeterminate and you're going to get a whole bunch of that. So. Go ahead and write that even though I said it a couple times. So never plug in infinity or negative infinity before using only leading term. Remember these are very special infinity or negative infinity. If you're just plugging in 4, you had the limit as x goes to 4 of this, you would just plug in 4 to the whole thing. Alright, so number 2, same idea. The leading term is 8x to the ninth. And we want the two limits. We want the limit as x goes to infinity and x goes to negative infinity, but just the leading term. Okay, so we plug in our infinity. A really large number to any positive power. It doesn't matter if it's even or odd when it's positive. So you can just see that here. We raise it to the ninth, it's still positive. We have 8 times positive large number. And if we multiply a positive large number by 8, it stays positive. Right. 
so that the limit as x goes to infinity of this polynomial is infinity and now if we want to do negative infinity we use our leading term again make sure you plug in negative infinity this time and since the power is odd here if we have a really large negative number it sh will stay negative so let's just see that Oops. So we got negative one zero 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 raised to the ninth power stays negative so let's write that common in there since the power is odd it stays negative just like a number negative one to the third power would be negative one and then if we multiply a really large negative number by a positive number it stays negative so we get negative infinity so let's comment that of negative large number times positive equals a negative large number so these kind of problems they definitely take practice but once you practice them a few times there's only so many possibilities so, and you might notice some shortcuts along the way but I'd rather you figure those out yourself because there's so much little material in this section that you should just look at how to do the problems and then if you figure out a shortcut on your own that's okay all right so the last thing as far as limits at infinity is rational functions now we already said what a rational function was but I just wanted to write it down again it's a polynomial divided by a polynomial so imagine this was on the top and this was on the bottom of a fraction that would be a rational function uh, rational functions are actually easier to deal with as far as limits at infinity because there's only no I would say there's only there are more possibilities but they work down the same way if you understand the polynomial one you'll understand the, the rational functions so the idea is to only use the leading terms of the polynomials simplify And then one of the following three things will happen. When you simplify, it might become a number. And that's your answer. If you simplify and the exponent is on the bottom, exponent of x. Actually, let's just say x is still on the bottom. then the limit is zero if x is on the top then we do like the polynomial All right, so we'll see examples to make this make sense um, but the idea is if you're doing a limit at infinity of a rational function which you can see right here this first one rational function 10 minus 3x over 4x plus 7 and we have limit as x goes to infinity then we want to implement this idea only use the leading terms of the polynomials and simplify
Now, what I mean by that is if, if it's on the top, it stays on the top. If it's on the bottom, it stays on the bottom. So our leading terms are negative three x on the top and four x on the bottom. We got the limit as x goes to infinity of negative three x over four x. Now we want to simplify. And now, we can't simplify the numbers here. Negative 3 and 4 have nothing in common, but the x's cancel in this one. So we are left with just negative 3 over 4. Since only a number remains, that's the first example, or first thing I have over here. That is the answer. So our answer to this one, it doesn't really feel like we did anything, but you know, if this limit was like five or something, we would just plug it in. If it's infinity, we take the leading terms of each part, simplify that, and if a number remains we get that answer negative three-fourths. Now since this is a fraction it's usually pretty hard to tell if you graph it. We can look at a graph of y equals 10 minus 3x over 4x plus 7 just to see if we believe it. So we got 10, oops I need my parentheses, 10 minus 3x divided by 4x plus 7. That's not a 7. I'm going to hit zoom 6 just to get the normal picture. And as we go towards infinity, so we're going towards the right, you can see that as we go towards right, it's definitely flattening out. Um, but since it's a fraction, it's really hard to tell. Negative 3 fourths is about right there, so it looks like it's flattening out right about there, which checks out if you want to trace it, now as we go to the right, what is the y value going towards as x goes farther and farther to the right? Well, really, it's, it's really impossible to tell. You have to go pretty far. You can plug in a number, um, meaning if you want to hit the value and plug in like x equals 10,000. Uh, why did that not work? Not sure why that's not working. Maybe it has to be on the graph. All right, let's see here. I made the x values go from zero to a thousand. So if we hit calc value x equals five hundred. Yeah, you can see it's at x equals 500, it's pretty much flat now. And we're at negative 0.74. Negative 3 fourths is negative 0.75. So it's definitely a believable thing. So we'll just go through and do a couple more so you can see all three pop up. All three scenarios. Okay, so number two here. Evaluate the limit as x goes to negative infinity. So just be careful on that when we do our problem. We'll have to make sure we use the correct one, but it's still infinite. And we have a rational function, 10 minus 3x squared over 4x plus 7. All right, since we have a rational function, we want the leading terms. The leading term on the top is negative 3x squared and the leading term on the bottom is 4x. And we only use the leading terms, just like last time. So we got the limit as x goes to negative infinity. We got negative 3x squared over 4x. 
Can we simplify this? Yes, we can cancel an x out. We cancel the one of the x out on the top with the x on the bottom and we're left with 3 over negative 3x over 4. Right, so this one is the third possibility. If x is on top, do it like a polynomial, mean, meaning plug in negative infinity. And we want to see whether it is positive infinity or negative infinity. Right, so go ahead and plug it in. We got negative 3 and then negative infinity over 4. You know, do as we did before. If we have a really large negative number and we multiply it by a negative number, it becomes a really large positive number. So we get positive infinity on the top over 4. Right, really, really large negative number times negative 3 is going to be a really large positive number. And then if we divide that really large positive number by 4, it should stay positive and be very large. So this stays infinity. It doesn't matter what you're dividing by. It, this could be even a million. The, the really large positive number is going to stay really large and positive. So that is our answer to number two. It's infinity. All right. And then number three. Same idea. We have a rational function again. And the limit is going to negative infinity. Since it's infinite, we want the leading terms. So we got the limit as x goes to infinite, negative infinity, negative three x on the top, four x squared on the bottom, Simplify, same thing as always. This time the one of the x's on the bottom cancels out with the x on the top. So we are left with negative 3 on the top and 4x on the bottom. And this time the x that remains is on the bottom. When there's an x on the bottom but not on the top, the limit is 0. For infinite limits. Right, if this, once again, if this was just a number, we would just plug the number in at the beginning. Since it's an infinite limit, when x is on the bottom, not the top, after we simplify, our answer is 0. All right, but as far as infinite limits of rational functions, those are the three possibilities. Once again, you might work a few of these and notice some shortcuts, but it's better to just be able to do one approach for every problem, and then if you figure out the shortcuts on your own, that's something you can do. All right. The last section here is just really putting it all together, uh, figuring out horizontal and vertical asymptotes of rational functions. We've really done this already, but we didn't put the words to it. 
Right, so we say a rational function r has a vertical asymptote of x equals c if the limit as x goes to c of r of x equals a number over zero. Basically, if the one-sided limits are infinite, actually, let's word this even a little easier than that. If you plug in and get number over zero, there is a vertical asymptote at x equals c. And a rational function may have any amount of vertical asymptotes. It doesn't have to have any. It can have one. It can have more than one. Now, for a vertical asymptote, or sorry, a horizontal asymptote, we say a rational function r has a horizontal asymptote of y equals number if the limit as x goes to infinity of r of x equals that number. So what this is saying is that we figure out horizontal asymptotes by doing the limit to infinity. You only have to do infinity, you don't have to do an a infinity as well, just one is good enough. Um, and the important thing about a um, horizontal asymptote is that number must be finite, meaning, you know, if we look back here, part A, we got negative three fourths, part C, we got zero. Those would be the horizontal asymptotes of these things. For part B, our limit was infinity. That means there is no horizontal asymptote for this one. Right, but we just have one problem here. Find all horizontal and vertical asymptotes of f of x equals 4x squared plus 13x minus 12 over x squared plus 3x minus 28. Um, I guess I, I didn't say this, so I want to go ahead and underline it. A rational function may only have zero or one horizontal asymptote. It cannot have more than one but it doesn't have to have one. Uh, but for this one, I'll do the horizontal asymptote first. So what we want to do is the limit as x goes to infinity of 4x squared plus 13x minus 12 over x squared plus 3x minus 28. Now what you want to make sure you do is, since we're doing a limit at infinity, only do the leading terms. Only the highest power. Alright, so we do the leading terms, get rid of the rest. We got 4x squared over x squared. Simplify it just like we did before. The x squareds cancel out and we're only left with 4. And just like we talked about in the previous part, that is our answer. Um, but it is y equals 4. Don't just write 4 because it will be marked wrong. As I mentioned before, you might not have a horizontal asymptote, so don't assume you will. In your problem, just do the limit like we did in the previous problems. All right, so the vertical asymptotes now the vertical asymptotes are kind of different. You know, they're definitely different than doing the horizontal asymptotes because the vertical asymptotes appear where the denominator is zero and the numerator is not. You can actually completely um, avoid doing limits here, but that's not a good idea. You know, that's what we've been doing. What we wanna do is factor and cancel, then see what x values make the denominator zero. 
So it's not really doing the limit at all. Um, we're kind of bypassing it. So what we'll do is just go through and do the problem like I've described it, and then it'll be easier to explain the vertical asymptote. So we want to start by factoring our rational function. All right, and you will be able to factor these if they're quadratic like this. And I know it's not always the preferred thing to factor when the leading coefficient's not one, like before right here. Um, we can do the bottom first. Uh, two numbers that multiply to negative 28 and add to 3 are 7 and negative 4. So the bottom factors to that. If it's been a while since you factored without this number being 1, remember you multiply these two, the a and the c, for a negative 12. And we want two numbers that multiply to that. Do negative 48 and add to the 13. All right, so what two numbers will multiply to negative 48 and add to 13? Well, think about factors of 48. 1 and 48, definitely not. 2 and 24, no. Can we do 3? Yeah, we can. 3 and 16 will work. We'll do negative 3 and positive 16. All right, so remember the way to do this, if it's been a while, is we want to make 16 happen so if you do 4x and multiply it by 4, that'll be 16. I'll give us a 16x, and then the negative 3 will be x and negative 3. Right. So you should have learned this, and if it's been a while, remind yourself. You probably learned it a different way. There's a lot of ways to do it. But that's one of the ways to do it. You know, we're really making sure that when we do, if we were to FOIL this out, the insides and outsides would make the positive 13x. So that's how it factors. All right. Now we cancel out if we can, and you'll notice there's no common factors. Yours might have some common factors, but mine does not. So if there's, once you cancel out, or if there's nothing to cancel out, now set the denominator equal to zero and solve the remaining x values. Are the vertical asymptotes. Right, so we set the denominator equal to 0. We got x plus 7 times x minus 4 equals 0. We set each part to 0. We got x plus 7 equals 0 and x minus 4 equals 0. And we get negative 7 and 4. And these are the vertical asymptotes. And what I'll go ahead and do is just graph this uh, function so you can see the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Go back to our graph. We have 4x squared plus 13x minus 12. I got my parentheses. We divide that by x squared plus 3x minus 28. 
Right. Mm -hmm. And then hit zoom six, make sure you're in the standard window. Now you can see our graph kind of breaks up, but if you want to zoom out a little bit, we see we have two vertical asymptotes. It looks negative seven, negative one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It looks like it's broken up there. And at four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, that looks right. And then the horizontal asymptote we found at the beginning is y equals four. What I can do is just graph y equals four. So you can see that it does flatten out at y equals four. It doesn't matter what happens in the middle part, it's just at the ends for the horizontal asymptote. Now the reason you have to do this factor and canceling out for the vertical asymptotes is if something cancels out, remember from last section, that's where we have a hole. And a hole is not a vertical asymptote. So you have to make sure you factor and cancel. Right, but as far as limits at infinity and infinite limits, that's what we need covered.